When was the last time you heard an inspirational story? My name is John Gross, and our guest today is Kim Lang from Farmington, Minnesota. Thank you for being here. Thank you, John. I asked her to send me a, a list of things that she's done, and she sent me a, a seven-page article, and it started <laughs> out with this first sentence. I started my life sleeping in an underwear drawer. <laughs> Kim, is that a true story? What happened? That is an absolute true story. I was born the seventh of seven children to a farm family that didn't have a lot of money. And my sister Cindy was only 10 and a half months older than I was. So the family crib was already being used, otherwise occupied. So my mom used her ingenuity and cleared out a space in the underwear drawer, just big enough to put this little bundle of joy that she brought home. <laughs> was life a bundle of joy for you growing up? You know, there were very happy times in my family. We had seven kids. We didn't have a lot of money, so we had to make our own happiness. We had to make our own entertainment. We had a lot of outdoors. We didn't have a lot of toys, but we had pets, and we had a hill to sled down, and we had a swing to swing on. So we had some very good times, but there were bad times too. She talked about the good, but how about the bad? How bad was it? My father came from a, an upbringing of abuse. Uh, he was an alcoholic, and he had a very, very mean disposition when he was drinking. He had a hairpin trigger. You did not want to make my father angry. If you did, you felt his wrath. He was a very strong man. He was a farmer and he worked as a meat cutter in a meat packing plant and he was a golden gloves boxer. And if you angered him, you would get punched, kicked, hit, you would be sent out to cut your own willow switch to be spanked with. And he was brutal. He had, aside to him, people get angry, but he would go into a rage. And he had a blind rage. When he started punching, he did not stop until he was worn out. Where did he hit you and the other children in the family? He would kick us with his steel-toed boots. If he thought you weren't listening, he would come behind you and lift you off the ground by your ears. He threw my sister off his back. He was beating our mother, and she jumped on his back to try and make him stop, and he threw her off, and her head hit the freezer, and she had double vision for about a month. It was a severe concussion, but back then we did not go to the doctor and he would hit wherever he could land a punch. Um, my mom took the brunt of it. One time he hit her in the eye so hard that he broke the orbit and her eye was laying on her cheek and he wouldn't take her to the doctor. She had to wait until my brother got home to drive her to the doctor. Whatever hides in the dark grows. The mouse becomes the lion in the dark, but if you get it in the open, the lion is a lion again. You've gotten all this out. How much does it help just to talk about it and to get it out? It's good to let things like this go so that they're not consuming you. This didn't define my life. I have so many blessings in my life and so much joy and happiness, and that's what I choose to focus on. These things went on in my life. These things are things that I survived and made it through, and they changed the type of person I am. You can have role models that are good, and you see that you want to emulate that. Just as powerful are these role models of the person you don't want to be. And you can take that and make your life what you want it to be. In the midst of that terrible things going on, did you find a way to be happy in that family? Oh my goodness, yes. We came from a large family. We didn't have a lot of money, but I always had somebody to play with. 
And Christmas time was magical at our house, not because we got toys or presents, but because all of the family was gathered there. And we had a tradition after our big dinner and everybody was eating, we were all in the kitchen and we'd be cleaning up. And inevitably, someone would start singing a Christmas song. And then all of us would join in and the harmonies and the beauty of those songs was just amazing. When you were growing up, uh, were your emotions positive because you had a close-knit family like that? And did you focus on the positive thoughts? Absolutely. In life, things that are bad are going to happen to everyone. That's life. Mm -hmm. It happens. There are exponentially more good things that happen in your life. If those are the things you choose to focus on, if those are the things that you choose to draw your energy from, that's the kind of life you're going to have. The other stuff is still going to happen. And coming from a large family, we had each other. We had similar experiences. We could call on each other when something bad was going on and crawl in bed with a sibling and you felt safer. When you were growing older, what was it like? Did things get worse or did they get better? Things got worse as I was growing older. I was maturing. Uh, my father, we had to move into town. When I was seven, we had a house fire and my brother Vernon was babysitting my brother Jim, my sister Cindy and I, and we had an oil burner for our source of heat, and the oil burner exploded. Vernon was downstairs, and he had the sense about him to run all the way upstairs and wake the three of us and bring us down. The oil burner was in the living room, and the kitchen was on the left and we had to run through those two rooms to get out the door. And my brother had been terribly burned, second and third degree burns, when the oil burner exploded. But he grabbed us and it was so hot by the time he was running us out the door that the windows in the kitchen on the opposite side of the house were blowing out. Mm -hmm. And he saved us. He saved my brother, my sister, and I. And because of his courage, I'm still here. I still had a life. I had children. I had grandchildren. And when my brother passed away, I gave his eulogy. And I had everyone there stand up that was there because of his courage. What did you say? Do you remember any of it? I do. I said, my brother is my hero, and because of his heroism, I'm here today. But not only me, my children are here, and my grandchildren are here, and the lives of my brother and sister, and their children, and their grandchildren would not exist without his heroism. I know there's someone, at least one, probably more people that are going through problems like you went through. Is there any advice you can give people that are going through problems, living a life they don't like, no. living a life they fear? Absolutely. Your life is so precious and you are so worthy and you are so loved. You do not have to put up with abuse. You do not have to put up with someone treating you in a way that makes you frightened, that injures you mentally, physically, or emotionally. You have opportunities to change. You have resources that you can reach out to. Please do. It's a scary thing to reach out and ask someone for help. It's scary to let somebody know what you're going through at home. You don't want anybody to know. It's almost as if you feel you need to hide it, but you don't. You haven't done anything wrong. You are lovable. You are worthy. Problems will break some people. 
but the same problems will help others break records. Yes. How important is your attitude and does it have to be good from the moment you get up until when you go to bed at night? I mean, is that important to have a positive attitude and to think positive thoughts? Absolutely. I wake up every morning and I wake up happy. I always have. My mom told me that when I was a baby even, I never woke up crying. She wouldn't know that I was awake until she heard me cooing and she would walk into the bedroom and find me awake and playing with my toes. And what kind of fun things did you do growing up? Oh my gosh, we had a hill that we rode a toboggan down. We'd, we had seven kids in this really long wooden <laughs> toboggan. And all at once? All at once. Oh, and oh my because God. I was youngest, I was in the very front under the scoop part and then all of them would sit behind me. Now the bad thing about a toboggan is you cannot steer it. And we had a lot of trees in our pasture. To steer a toboggan, you all have to lean <laughs> one way or the other to make it move. Well, nobody told me that. So the first time we went down in our toboggan, <laughs> everybody was saying, lean, lean. I didn't know which way we hit a tree. <laughs> True story. True story. Do you ever have snow going your face? Oh, all the time. <laughs> and probably from my brothers and sisters giving me whitewashes with the snow. Did they laugh? Did they oh, have? Oh, yes. Is that something you can make yourself laugh just by thinking about? <laughs> Absolutely. Kim Lang. Kim joined Toastmasters, and she won the prestigious humorous speech contest. Oh, those memorable firsts and lasts. Our lives are filled with them. How many of you remember your very first kiss? Thank you, Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and distinguished guests. I remember my first kiss. It was disgusting. <laughs> we were inexperienced teenagers. He had a giant mouth full of metal. He glommed onto me like some sort of mutated sucker fish. <laughs> By the time I pried myself free, I knew that would be the last time I kissed that boy. A memorable first for sure. One of my most memorable lasts was the last time I went sledding my son was a Boy Scout. One of the local farmers invited the Scouts and their families to his farm to go sledding. We packed up the car and we took off. <laughs> it was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. We'd had freezing rain the night before, so all of the trees and all of the grasses in the fields were shimmering in the sunlight. When we got to the farm, we parked along the gravel road. The kids grabbed their nice, cushy snow tubes and took off. My husband and I grabbed our sleds. Nothing more than molded sheets of plastic and followed behind. As we came up out of the ditch, we were welcomed by rows and rows of corn stalks, standing proud and shining brightly, like soldiers protecting the soil until spring. As we made our way up the side of the hill, I looked out over the sledding area. It was pristine, untouched, all of its icy glory glistening in the sunlight. Don't you think, at some point, during the drive down or my walk up the hill where I fell five times, some sort of a bell <laughs> or whistle or blaring siren would have gone off in my brain? One that said, Kim, you are about to slide down an ice-covered hill on a thin sheet of plastic. <laughs> nope, not one. 
When I got to the top of the hill, the scouts had a contest going already. Who could slide the farthest without falling off their sled? I watched a few of them go down, and it was hilarious. They were flying down that hill. They'd hit a bump and pop out of their snow tube like toast out of a toaster. <laughs> sled went one way, kid went the other way, and continued to slide down the icy hill on their snow pants. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> Finally, it was my turn. <sighs> Could I sit demurely on my sled like all of the other scout mothers? <sighs> no, I could not. <laughs> I had to take a running start. I had to go head first like Frosty the Snowman, giving Karen a ride to the North Pole. I finally heard the bells and whistles. It was too late. I was picking up speed fast. My cheeks were flapping. My eyes were watering. I know. If I could have levitated outside of my body and looked down at myself, I would have looked like a meteor crashing through Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> a ball of flame encircling my head. I wasn't outside of my body. I was in my body. <laughs> On a thin plastic sheet of death. <laughs> careening toward the cornstalk soldiers. I desperately tried to cram my toe through the crust of the ice, but it was no use. I did the only thing I could do. I ducked my head, and I plowed through those corn stalks like a bowling ball through bowling pins. They were snapping off and flying over my head. I left corn stalk carnage in my wake, and it still didn't stop. The ditch loomed right in front of me. I went down one side and up the other, and I was airborne. <laughs> Not for long. Gravity welcomed me back to Earth. Hard. <sighs> As I lay there, trying to catch the wind that had been knocked out of me, I knew I wasn't dead because I hurt bad. And I said a little prayer, God, please don't let a car come by. <laughs> when I could finally breathe, I peeled myself off that road, and I turned around to a whole hill full of Boy Scouts clapping and cheering me on. <laughs> <laughs> Look at how far she went. Woo! I did the only thing I could do, what any professional would do. I took a bow. <laughs> As I scooped up my sled and hobbled back to the car, I knew two things had happened that day. Number one, I did win that distance contest. <laughs> two, I had most definitely gone sledding for the very last time. <laughs> one thing Kim has done is act in plays, and not only one. How do you like acting, and what do you think about acting? Oh my gosh, I love acting. It's where I find my energy. I started acting as an adult because when I was younger, I had to go to high school, plus I had to work a part-time job. My mother couldn't work, so... Now, is that to pay for rent and things like that? Yes. My mom couldn't work. My mom and dad were divorced when I was 11, and I was the last one at home, so I was going to high school full-time, and I worked a part-time job and paid the rent and bought the groceries and put gas in my car, bought the car, and I didn't Are you really ever saying to yourself, what are you doing? Why is this happening to me? Or was it... No. 
No, absolutely not. It was what it was. You know, it was where I was at in my life. I needed to eat. My mom needed to eat. It's just what we did. I learned a very strong work ethic from both of my parents. You know, that everything wasn't bad about them. I, they both had a love of music that they passed on to me. They had this work ethic that they passed on to me. And it's just where I was at at that time in my life. It wasn't bad. It wasn't good. It just was. Kim has an amazing story. Besides what she's talking about growing up, she got into acting. And you love that, right? Oh, acting to me is phenomenal. I started acting at church. We did the Passion Play for 13 years. And then I was involved in acting at Children's Castle Theater with my children. And now I'm still involved in plays, some of them through Children's Castle Theater, but now with my grandson. And it's just amazing. And it's fun. And... I have been blessed with a very good memory, so that helps. Give me a good line that will wake us up. All right. This is from the play I'm practicing for right now, and I play the evil cockroach man. To set the mood, this is like one of those cheesy hero, anti-hero stories like Batman and Robin way back. It's like, you have been defeated, super duper. <laughs> My super atomic cockroach razor la laser. Mm. My s okay. All right. You have been defeated, super duper. <laughs> My super atomic cockroach laser ray gun will defeat. The defenses of your silly American army. And then I will enslave the entire world. <laughs> oh my gosh. Kim, <laughs> where do you get best? that emotion from? Where oh, do you get that? You know, athletes have muscle memory, actors have emotional memory. So everything that I've ever gone through in my life. I feel it deeply, happy times, sad times, times of fright, and it's all there waiting for me just to reach in and pluck it out and use it, use it in my daily life or use it on the stage. It's phenomenal. I was in the Christmas play. I had three lines. I was at a junior college, and it wasn't anything like you do, but it was fun. And what you're doing, especially your expressions, how do you get that? How do you, where's that come from? It's got to come from deep within. It does come from inside. I try and lose myself on that stage. When I'm on that stage, I'm no longer Kim. I am that character that I'm playing. And when I have scenes, that are touching or that are funny, I can draw from those experiences in my life that had those same emotions attached to them. How many plays have you been in? Over 30. Over 30? Is that just in the Farmington area? Yes, mostly in the Farmington area, Farmington, Lakeville area. Mm -hmm. Would you want to take it to another level? Or I would love to. I would absolutely, I would go anywhere if I could act. I don't get paid for it right now, you know. I. I try out for a lot of plays, but I don't always get picked because I have a body for radio. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but every now and then, a director will see something in me and they'll toss me a bone and they're never sorry. How do you memorize your lines or don't you memorize your lines? Oh, you have to memorize your lines. And thankfully, I've been blessed with a very good memory, but I run my lines every day, multiple times a day. Sometimes I cover up the script and read the lines before mine and then say my lines and peek and see if I did them right. Or I coerce my grandsons or my daughter into running the lines with me. I understand that you were put in a spot because someone couldn't do their role. Tell me that story. I did a play in 2006. It was called Baba Yiga and I played the evil Queen Khan. Children's Castle Theater also did the play again in 2015. I got a panicked call from the director one hour before the play was supposed to open saying, Kim, 
the evil queen con broke her wrist and she can't go on today. Can you help? I'm like, sure. And I hung up the phone and I was driving to the theater and said, what did I just do? <laughs> <laughs> they gave me the script. And by the time I went on, which thankfully was uh, the second half of the play, I had memorized 90% of those lines again. I, I could pull that out of my... That's a gift. It is, it is. And for the other ones, I taped on the back of a fan, a fold-out fan, and I would just peek at them just for reassurance. Oh, that's clever. Yes. And uh, I pulled it off. And it was so exhilarating and so Do you so still fun. remember any lines or anything that you said in that, or is that too much uh, bringing back a memory? Well, I have another one yes. that I did. I did this play over 10 years ago, and I got to play an Italian grandmother, and it's called Over the River and Through the Woods. And it was a soliloquy that I said, mm -hmm. breaking that fourth wall. Uh, between the audience and the stage, which is how the now, playwright wrote it. Now, what's that mean, it. break the wall? What does that mean? In theater, we are supposed to imagine that we are surrounded by walls. And mm -hmm. the fourth wall is the wall that occurs between the actor and the audience. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to break that wall. But this particular playwright wrote it that way. And I was an Italian grandmother talking to her grandson. <clears throat> and it went something like this. Nicholas, do you know what I have always wanted to do for years and years? I've wanted to go to Atlantic City. Yes, Nunes and Emma came back with such stories. But your grandfather would have no part of such a fancy place. But one day, I left him a plate in the icebox, and I went. And you know what? I didn't like it. <laughs> no. The whole time I was there, I was wishing I was back home taking care of your grandfather. I have to take care of him, Nicholas. He needs me to. How many people can get to be my age and can say that, that there was someone who needed them that much. I can say that, Nicholas. Mm. <laughs> mm. That is direct from the heart. I understand that over the years you've been in 30 plays, is that right? Probably over 30. I lost count somewhere along the line. Where do you rate that as fun goes? Is it one out of 10? How much fun do you have? Oh my gosh, 12. It's, it's amazing for me. It's very fun. I get to feed off the energy of the other people. You get to feed off the energy of the audience. And just getting to spend time with people that I love and care for, and even when it's new people, by the time you're done with that play, you've made lifelong friends. And sometimes I think you make your own good luck by expecting good things to happen in your life, by focusing on the positive and just having an attitude of gratitude. That brings you luck. How have you gone through what you've gone through, especially growing up at the, the fights and the hit and the downward spiral mm -hmm. I think it happened to you because you can help others I, th I think you could have a valuable speech to youngsters to seniors to whoever I think you got great ability in speaking what did you learn from that and what have you learned that you can help others learn that would help them I have learned that others opinions of you and the way that other people treat you in no way affects who you really are. You can be whoever you want to be. The best thing about my life is it's mine. Mm -hmm. I get to choose. I get to choose whether I want to face the day thinking happy thoughts, helping other people, or having a sad day, a down day. They happen because it's life. 
things in life happen. You, we have people that we love that pass, and we go through those emotions. But we don't have to stay living there because there are so many more good and wonderful and positive things that happen in our life that we can draw from. I encourage everyone to just open your eyes, open your mind, open your heart, and accept the things that come your way that are joyful, that give you energy, and hold them tight and embrace them, and then open yourself back up and pass that joy along to people that you meet. Every day, you'll be given the opportunity to help someone. Now, I don't mean necessarily financially or giving them physical objects that they may need. You can help someone mm -hmm. by giving them a smile. You don't know the last time someone genuinely gave you a smile or gave them a smile. That could be you. You could hold the door for someone. You can help someone pick up something they dropped. And it's a small thing, but to them, it might be the best part of their day. And it was you that got to give it. How cool is that? Whatever you focus on with emotion expands. So if you get up with a sour attitude, that could lead to a day of sour attitude. How important is it to get up, be positive, and think positive the rest of the day? Well, that sets your tone for the whole day. If you get up and you can say, man, am I lucky I got another day to try and get this all right. How fortunate are you? Do you know how many people got up yesterday morning thinking that that wasn't going to be their last day on this earth? And it was. I want to spend every opportunity that I get, every chance that I get, I want to make the most of it. I want to live a happy, grateful life. One of the most fun events that I took part in the past five years was Stevie Ray's <laughs> Improv in Chanhassen, Minnesota. That was so much fun. I have a memory problem. And I thought, well, if I take this class, maybe it'll help my memory. And it did, and not only helped it, but I had fun, and we got to compete, actually compete in it, and we put on a performance at the end of it. You took the class. What do you think of it? Oh, my gosh. How much fun was that class? <laughs> we got to meet all kinds of people that had the same passion that I had mm -hmm. for just laughing and having fun and being silly. And we learned so many techniques. We played games. There's an alphabet game where you start with a given letter of the alphabet and you have to tell a story. And your next sentence has to start with the next letter in the alphabet. And you better not miss one because the audience will let you know. And there is an audience. It isn't a class where you take just by yourself. Oh, you do that for, what is it, 10 weeks, 9 weeks? You do that for 8, 10 weeks. And then you put on a performance and people that you know will come and people that you don't know will be there too. It makes it a little <laughs> bit harder. But when you hit that line, yes. And it was so much fun. I've also it done is. comedy improv and that was fun. Oh, very fun. I competed one year in the funniest person in the Twin Cities contest and I came in second. Really? Yes. I know that contest. Yes. Do you? Yeah, well. it was very fun. It was very fun. But number two, you know, but I had goals and aspirations of reaching number one, and I did that in Toastmasters. Something that has stood out more than anything else as we've talked is your emotion that you show. Can you give us a couple more lines or a couple more examples of Kim Lang from the heart and soul? Where you get into it. Where I get into it, right. I remember long ago, the first time I became a mother. When they laid that sweet smelling baby in my arms and I met the little being who had been kicking me from the inside <laughs> and I finally got to put a face. You have never felt such love for another human in all your life. You love your spouse, but this, 
this little human that you made is actually a mother's heart coming to life on the outside of her body. And all you want to do is hold him close, kiss him, and love him forever. That's very moving and, and touching. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> There's another side. There that is. I, there we are. Oh, yeah, <laughs> another, another side is Jim Carrey, yes. <laughs> I want you to show us the other side. So Explain here's, what you're doing, and let's see the other side. I love this. <laughs> so here's the other side. When I won that Toastmaster competition, you could not contain me. It was like, yes! <laughs> Yes, I did it! Oh my gosh! Can you believe it? Can you believe this? I am so lucky! I'm the luckiest woman in the world! Yes! Whoa! Yes! Now, I didn't hear that at the competition. <laughs> you didn't do that at the competition. When did you do that? You went to the bathroom and talked <laughs> yeah. to the mayor? In the car on the way home. In the car on the way home. <laughs> Another example of that, what would that be? Maybe from a play or some something that you like or quotes that you like. I love this quote, if your family isn't first, it's last. Where is your family? And I know your family is at the very top of the list. Oh, my family is so important to me. I love them each so dearly. My husband and I have been married 38 years. We have two adult kids. I have two grandsons that make me laugh every single day. They're, I love going to their competitions. The oldest one is in marching band. The youngest one is in baseball. And his team won their competition for the whole class uh, last summer. This last summer, uh, it was a three-day tournament. And on Sunday, they were down to 10 players. And it was hot. It was 97, sweltering, and they had to play four games, and I was there for every single one of them, screaming my head off. And what did it sound like? <laughs> it's like, yeah, come on, guys, you can do this. No freebies, no freebies. Make them pitch to you. Yeah, that away. Don't let that ball get by you. Come on, guys, you can do this. Yes, look at that. Home run, grand slam. Way to go, buddy. Yes. You didn't have enough emotion there. Oh, my gosh. Where does that come from? Oh, my God. Deep inside. You know, I'm an exuberant person. I always have been. And I can't keep the joy in. I can't keep the excitement in. I, I know that some of the other teams were annoyed with me, but I don't care. Yes, exactly. I don't yes. care. If your family isn't first, it's last. How important is that quote? going through what you went through as a youngster. How important is that quote? From all that you know now, how important is that quote? If your family isn't first, it's last. Priorities. Priorities, yes. Growing up, seeing the things that I saw and going through the experiences that I had without my siblings, without my mom, I don't think I would have had such a great outcome. We bonded together. There were Friday nights, every Friday night after we moved into town, my sister and I would wait to hear the door. It was Friday nights were payday, and my dad would go to the bar. And when he went to the bar, he would drink, and get very mean. But it was a recurring thing every Friday night, and Mom finally got tired of it and divorced him. And three years later, he was killed in a car accident. He had been drinking. It was September 1st, and it was Labor Day, 1975. And my mom chose one child each month on the 1st to call him and ask for the child support money because he was using it as control. He was divorced, oh. but he still used that as control. He wouldn't give her the money. And I drew the short straw that night. And I had to track him down at a bar 
and I asked him for the money. And the last thing my father ever said to me was, even my baby doesn't love me anymore, and he hung up the phone. And that night, he was killed in a car accident. The emotions still seem to be strong. Mm -hmm. Have you been able, after what went through, you know, in your early life, have you been able to forgive him? Absolutely. I know that he came from a childhood of abuse. I realize that he had some mental issues that were not being addressed. I know that he loved me in the only way he knew how. Mm -hmm. He brought what he learned forward to his wife and his children. I saw that and knew that was what I did not want as a mother, as a parent, as a wife. There are good examples in our life that we want to emulate. There are also examples in our life of things that are bad and we know we don't want. Both can be a teaching tool. I think you would be a great teacher. Um, from what you went through, mm -hmm. what advice do you give to people that are going through the same thing that you went through and are getting up crying every day? What advice do you give to people to get through the problems, to get through the pain, and to live their life the way they should live it? First things first. Get the help you need to get out of any dangerous situation that you're in. Because I am here to tell you, you are worthy. You are loved. You are lovable. No one should make you feel any less than you are. Don't stay in a dangerous situation. When my mom was going through what she went through, we didn't have the same opportunities to reach out for help that exists today. I promise you, if you make the call, no one is going to say, you brought this on yourself, you deserve this. Absolutely not. They're there to help you, to keep you safe. And your life is your life. Get rid of the things that are bringing you down. Get rid of the things that are keeping you from being less than you can be because you are worthy. Please make that call. Tell me about your husband. Mm. My husband and I have been married for 38 years. Wow. He is a gentle, quiet man. A little much different than your dad? <laughs> Oh, very different than my dad. I, I went the polar opposite. I may have gone too far. I told my <laughs> sister. <laughs> I told my sister one day, I, I might have gone too far the other way because every now and then I have to poke him and make sure he's just awake still and listening. But uh, he, yes, he's very gentle. He loves me and lets me know that I am loved and he's just a gentle soul. It's fun the way we yeah. met. And how you met? Our, my brother and Walt's sister were born one day apart, and our mothers were in the hospital room together. And when they got to high school, his sister had a big crush on my brother. Hmm. And him being the dog that he is, didn't want to do his homework, so he coerced her into doing this homework. And she brought it over one day, and I met her, and she was just a very sweet, young lady and invited me out to their house for a bonfire and I saw Walt walking down the stairs and my heart did a flip and I couldn't breathe and I just said wow I, I'm going to marry him someday even though he was ten and a half years older than I am happy I marriage happy marriage you know I will say as in every marriage, yes. there are times, oh, right? Oh, there are, yeah. Absolutely. But very loving, you know, you weather those storms when the kids are little and life is crazy and there's no money and everything's running rampant. At the end of the day, 
you crawl in bed with this person who just warms your heart and the stress of the day melts away and you can get through anything. I wish you could have been at the Toastmasters competition. I was there sitting at a table that was really right next to the stage. Oh. Guess who was there? Her husband, the kids, the grandkids, relatives. After she got done and she won, I, I, I covered <laughs> Super Bowls and there wasn't so much emotion. They were, yes, just like she does. They were clapping like this. All of us were giving each other a high five. I was so excited for you. She has an emotion that can go up like this. And I'll give you an example. I'm just going to throw out a little improv at her. I want you to imagine that in, uh, at Valley Fair, okay. uh, they're putting in a brand new roller coaster. And oh, this yeah. isn't only a roller coaster. This is going to be the biggest roller coaster ever invented. And Kim has the privilege of going on that ride with her grandchildren. And can you sort of relive what happens that night as you go on that first ride and you're being covered by all the TV stations? Go all ahead. right. All right, are you ready, guys? Here we go. Are you ready? We're going up this hill. Oh my gosh, look how far that is down there. Are you ready? Come on, get ready, get ready. Arms up, no holding on. Are you ready? And over the top we go, yes! Woo! Yeah! And the cheeks are flapping, and you're going around the curves, and your tummy's flipping. It's like, don't fall out, don't fall out. Oh my God, get your arms up, here we go. And the wind's blowing your hair, and oh yeah, here comes another hill, and and we made it to the end. Was that fantastic? <laughs> oh my God, let's go again. <laughs> you are amazing. What is the, the beauty of that is that you got into the story. It wasn't, well, I went on a roller coaster. You were yeah. there. Yeah. Is that what you do for a speech? Is that what you do when you prepare for something that you literally get into character? She told me that uh, she has been in 30 different plays and uh, any lead roles in those 30 plays? Yes, I've had a few lead roles and major roles. When I was in Over the River and Through the Woods, the Italian grandmother, I was in The Re-Gifters. I played just this craggy, old, nasty mom. Let me hear the old crabby <laughs> mom. Do you remember <laughs> like, any of that? No. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. <laughs> I love it. I, I have to get into it. No, I, no. I have to remember. But what, what is it like getting into character? How do you get into character? You know, there's, there's muscle memory and there's emotional memory. And when I am on the stage, I picture myself in that exact scenario in real life. To me, the stage is real life. What's going on on that stage is my life at that moment. So if I'm the crabby old lady or if I'm the Italian grandmother or I'm the evil cockroach man, I just draw from my emotional memory of times in my life that I had those similar emotions. Wow. Can you, can you draw on one of those emotions in any play that you've done or any speech that you've done or anything that you've done? Oh, sure. I, I'll do a little snippet from the play that I'm in with my grandson out at the... Dakota County Fairgrounds, right. it's a Christmas carol. Yes, right. And playing Christmas present, it's like, uh, it's Christmas Day. <laughs> See all the people, they're happy. Scrooge, what right have you to be so miserable when you have all the wealth? They have nothing. Scrooge, this is Christmas. Christmas is a feeling. Christmas is what makes you happy. It's not money. It's not gifts. It's the season. It's the present. Anything else that you remember from the play you're doing right now? Right now? What is the Let's play see. you're doing right now? And, and, that, that is called Homer Price, and I play the evil cockroach man. Okay. I did that line for you already. Yes, that you was want me very to do good. it again? Uh, Anything else that you there, remember? Uh, from that play, uh, let me think one moment, please. 
going through the lines in my head right now. What do you like to do for fun? For you, Ooh. what is fun? Where do you go and who do you go with? For fun, it's generally something with my family. It's going to a corn maze or watching the grandsons swim in just a giant vat of kernels of corn and coming home and emptying their pockets. It's going to an apple orchard. It's going to a football game or a baseball game or watching a marching band competition, going fishing, going camping. It's all family-oriented stuff, really, is, is where I find my joy. And then on the stage, actually. I love this quote, if your family isn't first, it's last. Where do you put your family? I, I know you put your family front and center, on top. No, I can't do what you want me to do because I can't get my grandkid somewhere, <laughs> Dairy Queen or wherever. So I am a woman of faith. So it's God, and then family, then self because my family truly is a gift from God. And I have been blessed with them and I am thankful each and every day for many things in my life, but my family is one of the things that I'm most grateful for every single day. And what about your children and grandchildren? Are you close to them? Yes, they actually, everyone lives with me. Uh, my daughter unfortunately went through a divorce and they didn't have anywhere to go. So I have the pleasure of seeing my grandchildren and my children every day and they just bring me such joy. I had the, the luck of being able to meet some of the best speakers in the world, people like Les Brown. Got to know him, went to a high school with him and we did a little play and he came up to me and said, hey, let's get together, we'll speak together, we'll be salt and pepper. <laughs> and he laughed. <laughs> Got to know Zig Ziglar, one of the greatest speakers of all time, and was with him six times at the NSA, National Speakers Association, convention. Yes. What's the greatest thing that you have learned about speaking? And, and I think you would be an amazing speaker. Have you thought about that, making oh, money as a speaker? I would love to do inspirational speeches, humorous speeches, Anything to bring help or joy to anyone, I would absolutely love that. I think you've got something that no one else has mm -hmm. from the inside out. Not only what you've read, but what you've learned from the heart. And that's the biggest lesson you learn of all. And I think you have a message for so many different people from grade school up and also for parent sessions and for teacher in service. Have you thought about being a speaker? Yes, I would love that. I enjoy the energy that I get from speaking. And most of all, I enjoy taking the blessings and the lessons that I've learned and passing them along to other people to help them in any way that I can. Or if it's just a company celebration, being able to make somebody laugh, oh my gosh. Your day can't get any better than bringing joy to someone else. I have been at speeches, and this is no joke, I've been at speeches where speakers are being, well, it's so good to be here today. And they're so nervous. And they, they are bound by their notes. If, and what I like about you is that you, you don't, I don't think you would have notes that you'd get up and you'd talk from somewhere, and if you talk from your heart, you're going to get people, and they will not only listen to you, but you'll reach their heart and soul. And I think that's what you have, and I'm so impressed with what you do and how you do it, especially with your family and your focus on your family. What a great message you have. Thank you, John. What did you... Before we sign off, I would like to hear this emotion again. I mean, it is so good. I've heard a couple... How do you get that emotion that you have? I lived it and because I lived it I can relive it and I can draw it whenever I'm ready and right now I am on top of the world <laughs> because I got to sit with an amazing man
again. And I got the opportunity to talk about the things that are passionate to me. Oh my God, what could be any better than that? Yes, I have won the speaker's lottery. Yes. Oh my gosh! I'm I'm ready to buy it. If you're selling if you're selling right. if you're selling CDs or DVDs, I will buy one on the outside. You have amazing potential. I don't think you even know what you have within. I think all that all that's needed for her to go to the skyrocket on top is for one big name person to hear you or see you, and I, th I think it's going to be a rocket that's just going to take off. And the thing is, you're not going to start from the bottom. You've already got the stuff that very few people have. And I love your message of children. I love your message of family. I love your, your, your message. And it, it wasn't you just talking. It was you literally feeling from your heart to our heart. What is your goal for the next year? I would love to get some jobs in the speaking arena, somewhere that I can share my message. I really want to be able to help people through some of the things that I went through and let you know that the life that you lived doesn't have to dictate the life you're going to live. You get to choose. You get to choose each day what you will draw from your past. If you dip into that well, and bring out the things that are joyous and good because that well is so much larger than this little bucket of bad stuff that happened. I don't wanna live in the bucket. I wanna live in the well. <laughs> I wanna be where all the water is, where I can splash and play and have fun. Instead of the bucket, let's go to the well. Let's have some fun. One of the top speakers in the world gave me this tip and it really worked. When you get up in the morning, you go to the mirror, you look in the mirror, and you have positive self-talk. Today's going to be a great day. I'm looking forward to today. And then you smile into the mirror, and you see yourself smiling. And it doesn't have to be long. It can be 30 seconds or 45 seconds. But it's positive affirmations about you and where you're going. Instead of saying, ah, this day's going to be terrible, no. Say something good about it. And on the way to work or wherever you're going, have this positive self-talk run through your mind day in and day out. And if you have it run long enough and you believe it long enough, that's one thing. If you say something over and over and you say it long enough and hard enough and believe it enough, guess what? It's going to come to pass. It is. It's going to come to pass. And I think it's definitely going to come to, to you for the, the work that you've done and the emotions that you have. I don't think there's anybody around that has what you have. And I'm very, very impressed. And what I'm most impressed with is your family and where you've come. What, what is your final, we're wrapping up, but what is your final advice to someone that, that is having problems at home and doesn't know what to, what to do, they know whether to go right or left or straight ahead. How does someone get through problems and get through emotional stress? I will tell you this, every person alive has had tough times. Maybe not some as tough as others, but every person has also had exponentially more good times. When you get up every day, be thankful that you got another day. You will make it through those tough times. There is help out there for you, whether it's with a loved family member, your mom, your sister, your brother, a niece, a nephew, a cousin. There are people who love you. So if there are people in your life who are causing you grief, who are causing you pain, get rid of them. Get rid of that baggage. You're not a baggage handler. You don't have to carry someone else's baggage with you. Your life is yours, your choice is how you want to live it. I choose to live in the joy, and I hope you make that same choice. Thanks for watching. What a great speech. I predict she's gonna be a full-time speaker sometime. If you need a speaker, here she is, Kim Lang. Kim Lang from Farmington, Minnesota. Thank Thanks for watching, and Kim, what a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, John. Come on, let's go. Yeah! Woo! <laughs> yeah! Yeah!